Hello friends. For today's video, I wanted to have a discussion about some of the impacts of book talk hype and some of the ways that it seems to have affected marketing, affected authors' careers, our impressions of certain authors and their works. And I'm going to reference a specific book that really made a lot of these thoughts come to mind. The book is Immortal Longings by Chloe Gong. This is a newer book by this author. In fact, it's pretty much brand new. And the reception that it's gotten and some of its criticisms and the average rating are kind of surprising. I did read the book and I had a lot of thoughts and I almost decided to do an in-depth book review for it, but then a lot of what I wanted to discuss was better suited for a conversation like this because a lot of my thoughts came down to the way I think that this is marketed, the way that I think this author and her being young has uh, been marketed, and just in general, the way that not just book talk, lots of apps, uh, the way that short form content can result in a certain way of books and series being represented and how while initially it might start out with a boom and it might help an author's name get out there, it can also create a certain reputation that in the long run can hurt the author. So that's a lot of, that was kind of a word salad. I feel like that was a lot of words, but not really being able to give a lot of details. So now we're gonna get into the details of what we're talking about here. And when I get to the end of the video, if there are other books that you feel really get into a lot of what I'm talking about, or if you feel like there are other things to mention, feel free to do so. I would love to see your sides to this conversation. And also I wanna say this is by no means trying to imply that people who make content for book talk are somehow ruining authors' careers and it's your fault that people feel a certain way or anything like that. It's just the certain kind of hype and then almost like a backlash to that hype that can happen. So there's obviously positive impacts that come from book talk. It is short form content, so it makes it very easy for people to hear about books and it makes it very easy for trends to take place. And if a book fits within a trend, then you're going to see that book talked about constantly. And if, if you see it talked about constantly, then when you go into the bookstore, you might see it at the bookstore and there's that recognition, the cover recognition, and then there is the trope marketing that comes into mind. And so instead of being like, this is what this book is about and having a formal synopsis in your head, you have like, this is enemies to lovers. This is like, if you combined Game of Thrones with Gideon in the Ninth, which is a marketing thing for Bonesmith, which is not Chloe Gong's book. But regardless, we start to have impressions of books before we've even picked them up. And that can be a good thing because sometimes I see tropes listed or I see certain character types listed. And I'm like, I like all of those things. And then it does make me more inclined to look into the book. My interest has been piqued. The difference I would say for a lot of us is that we will then do what I just said. Our interest is piqued and we want to look further into it. And what it feels like sometimes marketing forgets is that the substance of the book and the synopsis itself, even though that's just even that is a short form representation of the book, it still needs to fit the target audience. And it can't just be a list of tropes. So I would say a lot of people now in having book talk be such a prominent way that they're getting books talked about or they're getting books delivered to them, you could say, the idea of the book delivered to them, they're not necessarily looking to do some further research and then when they see the book, look at the synopsis on the inside flap or the back cover. They're like, I like those things, I wanna pick that up. And I do think that can lead to a lot of people being disappointed. It can also lead to a lot of people being really pleased. They find exactly what they're looking for. They don't really care about all those other details. They just care about those tropes. They wanna see those tropes. And that's the thing that's gonna lead a book to be on their TBR. So the initial hype, the initial presentation can be a good thing because it can help people identify what they like. If you like this, try that. You know, it can have that be very successful. And it can also boost an author's name. For people that are not already well-known authors, Stephen King, Sarah J. Mass, these names that so many people are very familiar with and those authors don't really need any marketing. If you have somebody come out of the middle of nowhere and suddenly there's a ton of people talking about their book on Book Talk alone, then 
there is now a good chance that author can have success, which is really exciting. It's so hard for a lot of authors to break into the industry, but but oftentimes book talk can be credited with authors starting their careers, which is really, really cool. So getting into now the bad side of things, the negative impacts. And the first thing would be what I was touching on before, which would be target audience. So yes, there are certain tropes and yes, there are certain buzzwords that are going to get people's attention. And the thing is, those tropes and the buzzwords can be delivered to people in very different kinds of books. You can get enemies to lovers, you could say, within a YA fantasy. You can get it in a dark romance. You can get it in all sorts of different things. And somebody who's looking for a fun YA fantasy might not be looking for a dark romance. So just saying enemies to lovers could result in somebody picking up a book that they don't want actually anything to do with. So it being such an incomplete part of the marketing is already in and of itself kind of a negative thing. But I think looking at it more long term and sort of the lasting effects, and this is where I'm going to be getting more into some things that have to do with Chloe Gong's works, is a book's reputation and the target audience. So an entire video could be made about YA authors transitioning on over to writing adult works. And that's what this particular book is. It is Chloe Gong's debut adult fantasy work. And after having read it, I think the target audience are adults. <laughs> I don't think the target audience are young adults. It doesn't mean young adults can't like it, but it just feels much more like the kinds of things that you find in adult fantasy when it comes to the level of thought put into the setting. The setting is this sort of cyberpunk city. It's very destitute and there's a lot of poverty. So the people are really not able to rise up because they don't even have the means to take care of themselves, let alone lead some kind of revolution against this monarchy. And so all the ways in which the city is developed and the details of the city, those are things that I tend to find more often in adult fantasy than young adult. And one of the criticisms I saw about this book was that it's constant exposition. We just, it's over and over and over again being given all these details. In my mind, I'm like, well, yeah, because I feel like that's really common. It's not that you can't have that criticism, by the way, for adult fantasy, because there are plenty of times I pick up an adult fantasy book and I'm like, I don't care because <laughs> there will just be so much unnecessary detail. But it, to me, when I read this book, I didn't feel like it was unnecessary detail. It felt like the amount of detail I would expect of an adult fantasy work. But I think perhaps the target audience that has been built up for this author would be a young adult audience, uh, older audience who tends to read young adult, or people who tend to gravitate more towards book talk books because early in her career, she got an enormous boost from book talk readers. So I think that now it doesn't really have, its, its target audience doesn't seem very clear. In my mind, the target audience is adult readers. But when you have authors transitioning from YA into adult, a lot of times the people that are going to pick up the book are the ones that already like that author, not necessarily new to that author readers. So another aspect of the book's reputation and something I guess, you know, I want you all to feel comfortable saying whether you think that this is true for you or not. So I think people have a certain impression of book talk books. Whatever that impression is for you could be different than what I'm going to describe. But I think a lot of people's impression of book talk books is that they tend to be very fun, very campy, very the kind of books that you can marathon and just devour in a sitting, and that they are less about the beautiful writing. They're less about the intricate world building. They're less about being extremely reflective and able to pinpoint and provide commentary on a lot of aspects of society. It doesn't really feel like, at least in my mind, the impression, I'm not saying that that's literally what I think. I'm saying I think that's what a lot of people think about book talk books. I think they have this idea that they're, they're sort of just fun, escape, fluffy, good time, adventure type of stories or romance types of stories. And there are, of course, the big names that have established that and have caused people, I think, to have that impression of book talk books in their mind. And so I'm kind of asking all of you, one, what is your impression of book talk books? And if you have this certain impression of book talk books, when an author writes something that is not within that, 
even if previous books fit within that, if they now are writing something outside of that box, are you interested at all? Or do you now have it in your head that, oh, I'm never gonna like something that the author puts out because that author just puts out, you know, like fun book talk books. Do you understand kind of the question I'm asking? So I'm not trying to like shade Colleen Hoover or anything like that. But if Colleen Hoover suddenly wrote a really hard hitting fantasy book or something, how many of you would bother picking that up? How many of you would think like, ah, this is not gonna be hard hitting, it's Colleen Hoover. How many of you would potentially do that? And I understand that I feel like with her, she has so many works that kind of, it's not really book talk that has established that reputation, it's all the many works that she's had that have made that reputation. But with somebody like Chloe Gong, she doesn't have that many books out. One of the first couple books was YA, and then another, and then now adult. And I'm getting at this point kind of hard because I kind of feel like the target audience are the people that maybe don't typically gravitate toward what you would find on a book talk table. But because she has this reputation, or her books, I should say, have this reputation for being the book talk book type, then the people who don't typically read that even if that doesn't fit this type, they're like, I don't want to read it because I just already have an impression of what it is. And then the people that are reading it aren't actually getting what they like. They're not getting what her book was, her previous books were. It doesn't really allow authors to go outside their book talk reputation. It doesn't allow them to transition into different tones, into different age ranges, into different styles. They kind of have to stay within that box. So going back to the example of Colleen Hoover, the reason I don't think she's really gonna suffer from a lot of the negative impacts like what I'm talking about is because she continues to put out books that are going to fit within what her readership likes. Chloe Gong has written something pretty different from her previous work. Uh, she has multiple works, but I'm specifically referring to these Violent Delights. She wrote something pretty different from that. She wrote something that truly did feel more like adult than young adult, but because it doesn't fit within the box, now the people that like those types of books are displeased with it. Not to say you can't have legitimate criticisms or that you're you're, you're just so dumb that you only like these and you can't judge the book for what it actually is. I'm not saying that. It's just a lot of us, when our expectations are not met based off of the marketing, we can't help but just kind of be like, that's not what I was looking for. So I think that, that this author and many authors try to write things different and they try to go outside of the box that Book Talk's reputation has put on them. And then it's really hard to do that. Another example would be, I haven't read Deadly Education by Naomi Novik, but Naomi Novik is somebody who writes very different books from book to book. And I don't see very many people going from Deadly Education to her Temeraire series. So it's the same kind of idea. It's like, well, Temeraire doesn't fit within the book talk type. So we're not gonna try to pick it up. And then also it, it can feel like the criticisms that do get put on the book are, as I was noting, more about how the book did not fulfill the expectations or how it's less it's less about what could be improved upon and it's more about how this isn't what they had written before. It's not what they what the reader wanted from this author. It's not like their previous works. And that makes me kind of sad because I always want authors to feel like they can write things, whatever is on them to write, whatever they feel passionate about, whatever stories in their head, whether it's really similar to what you've gotten before or it's drastically different, I want authors to feel like they can go outside the box and do what they like. Someone like Sanderson, he did something extremely different with his secret projects and he, I think, I would say from having read the books and chatting about them every single time one of the new secret projects comes out, he's seen a lot of respect and a lot of people have loved the secret projects. And even if they didn't like the secret projects, they've been still very supportive of this whole effort that he's put into it. And I, I feel like in a lot of ways, it's because he got to be responsible for his own marketing. He got to be responsible for how he put the idea of the secret projects out into the world. There wasn't a different team of people. There wasn't book talk, that wasn't what determined the reputation of his books. He had more of a say. So 
I really wanted to highlight this book and get into this book a little bit because while it's not a new favorite and it's not like, uh, oh my gosh, this was the most unique thing I've ever read. I do think that this book is going to be liked by quite a few people. I just don't think it has found its target audience. And I, I think that the setting itself was quite unique. I mentioned before how you do get a lot of descriptions about the setting. It feels very well fleshed out. This to me, to, to put it very briefly, it's kind of like cyberpunk anime. That, combine that together, that's the setting. That's the feel. It's very gritty. It's very edgy and it's just cool. <laughs> It's cool to the extreme. It's like, what would be the cool girl haircut? Like the really sharp, straight hair with the like straight bangs. And like, what would be the cool girl outfit? Like the cool coat, everything that could make this cool, cool vibes, the characters are gonna have that. The setting is gonna have like the cool, gritty elements to it. The weapons that are used are gonna be cool. Again, cyberpunk fantasy. That's what this, or excuse me, cyberpunk anime fantasy also though. That's what this book felt like. And the setup for the story is that you have this society that is very much experiencing poverty and there's a huge difference between most of society and the monarchy. And there's really no means of society being able to rebel against the monarchy. They're just so desperate to have something to get by on. They're just so desperate for any little bit of money, any little bit of food and somewhere to live and somewhere to have shelter. And our main character is somebody who has a past where she had firsthand experience with the monarchy and she wants to bring it down and she wants to kind of inspire the people to rebel against. She wants to be kind of like their warrior because she knows she has the abilities to do this. And so how she plans to do this is that there are these games that are meant to be entertainment for the people. There's cameras everywhere in the city and they capture these fights between people who enter the games. And in doing this, the character, our main character decides, I'm gonna enter this competition because whoever wins has an opportunity to meet the king. And it is in that meeting that she plans to kill the king, but she cannot get close to him in any other way. This is really her only chance because he's very, very well guarded. And so she enters these dangerous games where it is essentially a fight to the death. People can opt out of the games, but most people are so desperate for the prize, which is a lot of money, that they are willing to die if it means there's a chance that they can have a little bit more for themselves and their families. So that's the idea. The setting I thought was very different from a lot of the fantasy that I've picked up. I actually did kind of enjoy the cool factor. And then there's another aspect to it, the fan fantasy side of things, which comes down to the magic. People's chi, they have some individuals born with a jumping gene, which means they can put their chi into another person's body. So essentially their soul can jump from their body into another person's body. And if you overwhelm that person for a period of time, you can essentially take their body over for forever and kill their chi. So now you exist within that body. And there's certain rules that come to jumping. And I thought the rules and limitations were explored really well and just provided even more cool details that I quite enjoyed. And a lot of the people that are in the games have this jumping gene and it makes it really hard to defeat your enemy. And it also means that it can be dangerous for any innocent bystanders who are around. Cause if you're trying to take out the enemy who is in a certain person's body, if they are in that body and then they jump out, then the original person's chi, if you kill that person, then you killed that person, not just their body. Cause their chi, some individuals might've been able to hop out of their own bodies and so on and so forth. So it added a whole other element to the story. I thought that the jumping, there was just more and more and more to learn as the story went. And it was, uh, it was an interesting, cool, exciting, action-packed story with cool world building. So the last thing I'm gonna mention, besides just all the other things I already did, is just that in talking about tropes, you do see a lot of people only really caring about these, specific, not people, like the marketing only cares about like, what can I pull from the book and present to attract people's attention. And in this book, you do have an enemies to lovers aspect to the story. On top of that, the comp titles way of marketing books, I think has gotten so extreme <laughs> and it's setting books up to fail. And usually in a synopsis, it's not that big of a deal because there's more there in the synopsis to tell you what the book's about and you can use 
critical thinking skills to read the synopsis and be like, oh, that's why they're comparing it to these other things. This book, I didn't see anywhere in the synopsis that it was compared to The Hunger Games, but so many reviews kept talking about how it's like The Hunger Games <laughs> that I was like, is it, is, are people talking about this in the way that they, you'll, I'm sure many of you have seen where a person will hold up a book and then all around the book they'll list like the tropes and the comp titles. So I'm like, have people been saying it's like Hunger Games? Because yes, there are games. Yes, society is made up of a lot of poor people and there's some class differences that are really extreme. And yes, it's kind of like for the entertainment of the masses. But you can opt out of the games and you also volunteer to be in the games. And I'm like, isn't the whole thing in the Hunger Games that it, like, imagine if Katniss at the beginning, if her sister was asked, or not asked, told that she was uh, going to be in the games and her sister was just like, I don't want to be. That would be the end of the Hunger Games. In this book, the characters can choose to not be in the games. Even after they've entered the games, they have these like bracelet things and they can just stop and be like, I don't want to be in it anymore. It's not worth it. So I'm like, I don't feel like it's that much like the Hunger Games. But when we've gotten so accustomed to marketing being these very specific little snippets, then I get why some people would be like, oh, well, it... I was told it'd be like The Hunger Games, but it's not really. Or the opposite of like, this was too much like The Hunger Games, just because there's games in the story, I suppose. Again, there's some similarities. And if you thought it was too much like The Hunger Games, that's okay. You, you can think whatever you want. It's just, it was a really common thing I saw that I was like, I don't feel like it's that much like The Hunger Games. Am I the only one? Anyway, so I know this was a little rambly and, and hopefully some of the points I was making are relatively clear. I just find that while yes, she is an author and many other authors have been able to get a lot of success as a result of book talk and other apps and a lot of other individuals that aren't even involved in publishing, talking about her book, word of mouth, hyping the book up. While that has led to a successful start to a lot of authors' careers, I just kind of worry about the longevity of their careers. And I, I worry about the them having the freedom to write outside of the boxes that marketing has put them in and that book talk has put them in. So that was a really long, uh, uh, not rant. It was just, that was a lot of talking. So I'm very curious. You talk now. <laughs> Tell me your thoughts on this subject. Let me know if there are other books that you feel like fit into what I'm describing. And if you've read uh, immortal longings do you feel like it just seems as though maybe it doesn't it hasn't found its audience do you feel like the audience that would typically like it is staying away from it because of the reputation of the book potentially being like by a book talk author those sorts of things what are your thoughts basically is what i'm asking but anyway thanks so much for watching i hope you have a great rest of your day if you're interested in immortal longings i'll have it linked so you can check it out if it sounds kind of cool to you but i hope you have a great rest of your day and i'll see you later bye